a number of people on hearing that Tom Bradbury was preaching today asked me if I were going to be gone. To which I responded, in essence, no way. <laughs> uh, last week, I preached on the state of the church and the role of commitment in a time of decline. And this week, Tom is going to be the spokesperson in sharing with you the response of the church on the Cape to this crisis. It's a response that is not a mandate from the annual conference. This is grassroots. And it's the church on the Cape at its very best. It's about our future. And we are saying that we as a congregation are not going to fight to survive. We are going to take up the cross and thrive. The best is yet to come. And Tom, come on up. The reason I did it was because there's a fan up here. <laughs> and it actually turned out to be the coolest place in the church. But before I talk about what Ruth just said, I want to talk a little about, about um, the family and how it got here. And my kids hate it when I do this, but because of that, I decided to do it anyway. <laughs> and this is where they start to cringe, because these are the words that they recognize. In the year 732, <laughs> the world as we've come to know it was in doubt. A new emir of Cordoba, Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi, was surging through Gaul, which is present-day France. The city of Bordeaux had been sacked and looted, and Western chroniclers Chroniclers stated that God alone knows the number of slain. Only one man stood beside between the Muslims and the complete domination of Western Europe. That would be my 40th great-grandfather, Charles Martel. Yes, thank you very much. It's true, and it pays to have a genealogist in the family. Charles, we are told, was endowed with rare gifts for the Middle Ages. He was a brilliant strategic general who was able to adapt his plans in the battlefield and seize victories even when far outnumbered by his foes, forces, and weaponry. That was certainly the case of the Battle of Tours, the Poitiers, if you prefer. Historian Sir Edward Cressy wrote, the great victory won by Charles Martel gave a decisive check to the career of Arab conquest in Western Europe, rescued, rescued Christendom from Islam, and preserved the relics of ancient and the germs of modern civilization. Not bad for a grandfather. <laughs> in the years that followed, he is credited with laying the groundwork for the Carolingian Empire and the development of feudalism and knighthood. That would come to fruition during the reign of his grandson, my 38th great-grandfather, Charlemagne, the greatest of medieval kings. Now, Charlemagne was the most admired and enlightened leader of his time. He celebrated learning and promoted education created a system of government that saw to the smallest details of his extended kingdom. He promoted commerce and created the basis of our current judicial system. He defended his empire and led an army more than capable of protecting and extending its borders. He accomplished, all of his accomplishments and power led him to be named the defender of the faith, the Holy Roman Emperor. And when it came to faith, he made many converts in the medieval old fashioned way but that's a topic best left for another day. Not to make this all about me, but clearly one striking question arises from all this. What went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Link proposed to my daughter Stacy outside the gates at Buckingham Palace not that long ago. In two weeks, they'll be celebrating their wedding here at the Church on the Cape. And I can't help but think that if the family had paid a little more attention to detail, he could have been proposing on the other side of the fence. <laughs> Obviously, the family peaked too soon. <laughs> that was, however, our family's high watermark, and a devotion to God played a key part in it. After Charlemagne came Charles the Bald, you know, and, uh, who was king of France in the mid-800s. His son was called Louis the Stammerer, who passed the throne on to Charles the Simple. It was one, two, three strikes, and we were out of the monarchy. <laughs> it strikes me that life is all about the highs and the lows. In 1634, my ninth great-grandfather, Thomas Bradbury, 
arrived in York, Maine as an agent for Sir Fernando Gorges, his uncle, who had a patent from the king for much of New England. A few years later, Thomas moved on to become a founder of Salisbury, Massachusetts. All was going well, and he was a respected and prominent member of the community until a family low point came about. A disgruntled neighbor accused his wife, Mary Bradbury, of causing a blue boar to run across his path 13 years earlier and spook his horse. On that basis, she was accused of witchcraft in Salem and was brought to trial. We have the testimony from that trial. I do plead not guilty, said Mary. I am wholly innocent of any such wickedness. Through the goodness of God that have kept me hitherto, I am the servant of Jesus Christ and have given myself up to him as my only Lord and Savior. And to the diligent attendance upon him and the holy ordinances, in utter contempt and defiance of the devil in all of his works, is horrid and detestable. And accordingly, have endeavored to frame my life and conversation according to the rules of his holy word. And in that faith and practice, resolved by the help and assistance of God to continue to my, life, to my life's end. For the truth of what I say as to the matter of practice, I humbly refer myself to the brethren and neighbors that know me and unto the searcher of all hearts for the truth and uprightness of my heart therein, human frailties and unavoidable infirmities accepted, of which I bitterly complain every day. When it came time for her husband to speak, he came forward very slowly, facing a situation far different than any he had ever known. Concerning my beloved wife, Mary Bradbury, he appealed to his fellow judges, this is what I have to say. We have been married for 55 years and she has been a loving and faithful wife to me. Unto this day, she has been wonderfully laborious, diligent, industrious, and in her place of employment about the bringing up of our family, which have been 11 children of our own and four grandchildren. She was both prudent and provident, of a cheerful spirit, liberal and charitable. She being now very aged and weak and grieved under the affliction, may not be able to speak much for herself, not being so free of speech as some others may be. I hope her life and conversation have been such amongst her neighbors as gives a better and more real testimony of her than can be expressed by words. And despite these words, Mary was convicted and sentenced to death. Fortunately, the story had a happy ending for so many of her fellow citizens were outraged that she was released, the only person thus saved. And in an unrelated story, one of their daughters had married an influential lawyer and that didn't hurt either, which is another reason we're looking for Stacy's wedding. <laughs> Not, of course, that I'm suggesting that a similar fate could ever befall Shirley. <laughs> it is worth pointing out that in this darkest of hours, the appeal for help was made directly to God. It was my sixth great grandfather, Thomas Bradbury, who returned to Maine, serving as a captain in charge of the Indian trading posts on the Saco River in 1748 and 9. For that service, he was given land in Buxton and the family remained in that area until my father's time. I count that as a family high. My father, Charles Bradbury, was born in Cornish. When he was still young, my grandfather had moved to Lynn, Massachusetts to be near his wife's family and to take advantage of his big break of becoming a foreman of a paint company. Timing is everything and his timing was bad. The depression hit and he lost everything he lost his job, and another was hard to come by. They moved to a smaller place, and when they couldn't find or couldn't afford anything else, they moved again. Eventually, the only money coming in was that made by my father and uncle, both still children, from the neighborhood paper route, a dangerous job that often left them beat up and robbed by local gangs. When all thought that nothing could get worse, my father's older brother contracted diphtheria and died. He was 15 at the time. My grandmother had a nervous breakdown from it all, but still had to keep watching the kids and taking in laundry to make ends meet. It was another low moment, and my grandmother prayed for help. That help came when they received news that my great-grandfather had died and left them his home in Cape Porpoise. They made the decision to move back to Maine and ended up living on a farm across the street from the present Bradbury's Market. That was back in 1933. My grandmother wrote a short story of her life in 78. She said she had been through a lot, but despite all the pitfalls, she was able to conclude, I thank God for my blessings, 
I have lived in Cape Porpoise for 45 years. I am now 85 years old, so I live one day at a time, and I am grateful to be as well as I am. I have a good life, and I thank God as I have faith in him. My father recorded his life story as well. He says, life was hard in Cape Porpoise, but it was also very rewarding. Life here was so much better than in the city. We worked hard and we ate simple foods, but we were amply rewarded by a healthy, good feeling. The fresh air, the quiet, peaceful scenes of the village, and an overall feeling of peace and satisfaction. This was quite a change from the city, which we had known and had wondered about leaving. As I have said many times, the move to Cape Porpoise was the best thing that could have ever happened to all of us. A good part of that healing which took place happened in this church, in these pews. The family over the centuries had reached as high as we could go and had fallen just as far. Through it all had been a love of God and a dedication to serve. And the same was true for all the other families who filled our church pews, both then and now. Reverend Russell Pepe, our minister here back in 1962 through 64, he saw it. He says, the uniqueness of the church in the Cape cannot be found apart from its favored location on the rim of the mighty Atlantic. But that hardly exhausts the congregation's uniqueness. For the congregation is located also in the heart of the gospel and on the cutting edge of mission. The beauty of its position in space is equal by its beauty and spirit, as shown by the fact that the congregation has always welcomed the wanderer, guided the seeker, comforted the wounded, and challenged the worker, all in, in the enterprise of shaping disciples of Christ. I said the last time I spoke that I would only talk through the quotes of Wendell Berry. I think I have started to amend that to Russell Pepe. But I also might add Peter Landry. Peter is Drusilla's son, who grew up just across the square. He writes, like faith itself, the church in the Cape embodies both hope and affirmation. The hope is to be all it can be to support and enhance the community. The affirmation is the way it expresses who we are, where we come from, and where we are going. It is a place where the past is a presence, yet the future is as promising as sunlight screaming through stained glass windows. It is a place as old and solid as wooden pews that have seated generations, yet fresh as homegrown bouquet of flowers. It is a place of celebrations and a place of reverence, a place of music and a place of laughter, a place of challenging ideas and a place of familiar embraces. Most significantly, it is a place unafraid of change. From its earliest days, and like the nation, the church in the Cape has always been a place for the people and by the people. It's the future that we've been thinking a lot about lately. My family may have peaked too soon, but I was blessed enough to be here now with all of you when this church is peaking. I think that we can all sense that. We can feel it in the way we are encouraged in our successes, and comforted when we're down. We can hear it in the way our voices sing with the joy of the hymns of our faith. We can see it in the way that faith leads us to help those in need, both near and far away. Ruth calls us a mini megachurch, and she's right. In last week's sermon, she reminded us that the churches high have highs and lows in the same way that individuals or families do. It seems as though so many are struggling these days, many have failed, and I suspect that will get worse before it gets better. But we can't let Pastor Ruth down. We have to be the congregation that holds on, the one she brags about at clergy reunions. And it's important that we do, for I believe that in the years to come, our role will become even more important than it is today. If the church is to move forward, it will be from places like ours that the good word will be spread, where good examples will be set, and where good deeds will be done. We are on a high now, but we are bound for even greater things. All we have to continue to do, as Pastor Ruth told us, is hold on tightly to the rope. 
This is a place of light that eases the darkness far beyond these walls. I felt it, you felt it, and my dream is that the same will be true for all of those who sit in these pews, even when all of us are gone. It is the same dream that is shared by all of those who have volunteered to serve on a new church capital campaign committee. I assume that I was asked to serve on that committee based on the fact that I am descended by three or four homie, holy Roman emperors. <laughs> it's true that they lived 12 centuries ago and there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. Then again, it could be that I was free on Wednesday nights. <laughs> Regardless, the spirit has remained through all of the ups and downs and the faith, the faith remains. And though I'll never live up to those who came before, one has to do what one can. The goal of this new, com new committee is to raise and set aside enough funds so that this church will be empowered to do its work well into the future, during the highs and the lows. Only interest off the principal will be allowed to be spent. It would be money which we, with which we can enhance our ministry, increase our outreach, maintain this beautiful structure, increase visitations to those in need, fund programs to attract our youth, and much more. It would be money that would help <coughs> us face the challenges of the future, giving to those who will follow the comfort and joys that we know today. Now, I understand completely that whenever money is mentioned, we all start to squirm in our seats. And I, I know I do, and uh, I know that this will make you really move. Our eventual goal is to raise $2 million. That means that if we are successful, about $100,000 a year will be available to use on special needs or projects. That may seem like a lot, but when you think of such expenses as the purchase of last year's parking lot, it's not. Major expenses have a way of creeping up on you. This would provide a bit of a safety net. But before you get too nervous, you should know that we expect to raise this amount over time. Of course, we'd welcome any and all support now, but we'd also like you to think about the church and your estate planning. As John Alston once said, the only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind. We're hoping you'll help us to leave behind this church and all the good that it represents. We'll be talking a lot more about this in the weeks and months to come. If you'd like to get involved, then talk to a member of the committee. You'll get something in the mail about that. We're also going to encourage small dinners at people's homes, gatherings where we can sit, come together as a church family, and talk out some of the details, some of our hopes and some of our dreams. Please sign up as either a host or a guest. This isn't something to worry about. There's no need to fidget. This is something to celebrate and something to be proud of. This is our church family's gift to all that will follow, the continuation of the values we have found here, the passing on of our blessing. I'll leave this all with the words of Pastor Emeritus Bill Gardai. Gracious and loving God, we celebrate the fact that through your presence and guidance, you have enabled this Cape Orpus Church to thrive in faithfulness. Through the years, in response to people looking for a meaningful way of life, our fellowship has grown in gentleness and in kindness. It is our prayer that you continue to influence all that we do, all that we say, and all that we think. May we keep on trusting and following the way of Christ every day, long into the future. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>